So we're going to bring up uh, uh, Jacob, and he's going to get himself plugged in here. Uh, he's going to do a presentation on uh, YAML. Yes, we do. The cables are right here. Um, on YAML, the other form builder. There we go, HDMI. That'll do for you. Um, yeah, so, so Jacob uh, was working for a long time at MSKCC. Now you're still, at, it's still, no, am. still at MSKCC. Um, for those who don't... For those who don't know, MSKCC um, was one of the first kind of larger scale, large scale sites that got uh, launched on Drupal 8 earlier, much earlier this year, um, and two years. two years ago. It was in beta. Woo! So, and Jacob, Jacob worked really hard on that, so he got a lot of experience pretty early on in that cycle, and now he's going to impart some of that information to you. Um, I opened up your article. It's right here. Ah, perfect. And I, I, I'm going to address this because this is something that's going on in the YAML form module a lot where a lot of new people are coming in, and I'm very excited about that. Like, uh, that's, new people should be are welcome in the YAML form module issue queue. Actually, if you're, I look at which user is posting tickets, and if someone just registered to post a ticket in my queue, they go to the top of the list, and I address it immediately because I think it's really important. Drupal 8 needs more people to adopt it. it is, I think it's a little slow. Like the adoption of Drupal 8 statistically, it's slower than Drupal 7, and there's some blockers that are stopping people from adopting. But this presentation is about YAML. You can take it out if you want. Uh, well, I want to be able to use my laptop. So as long as people can hear me and I can just raise my voice without much hesitation. I'm going to start. Um, I would like to make this a little better to see. Yes. That looks a lot better, right? And I can just make things. That's better. Okay. Ah, look at that. And look at that. Okay. Do it this way. Use one hand. Okay, this presentation is about the YAML form module, the other form builder. Um, I'm going to start off and just introduce myself. I mean, my name is Jake Brockwitz. I worked with Morris on Kettering. We were one of the early adopters of Drupal 8. We launched one of the largest sites on a, um, a beta version of Drupal. Um, and I want people to adopt Drupal 8. That's one of my goals with the YAML form module, is to get more people into Drupal 8 and to encourage them to use it. Um, this is what the YAML form module is, and this is what the whole presentation is about. It's a form API, ba a FAPI based form builder for submission and submission manager for Drupal 8. And I will explain what FAPI is in YAML. Um, and that's really, I'm going to backtrack for people who are not familiar with these technologies just to kind of walk through them, and then I'll start walking through the module and why the module exists. So, what is YAML? Um, YAML is a simple and easy to learn mark data markup language. Uh, this slide just shows you what an example of some YAML is. It's just a way of describing data in a plain text format. It's very easy to read, user friendly, easy to type. You can type it. It's one of my favorite additions to Drupal. I like things that are simple. It's simple. You can go to the Wikipedia page for YAML and learn it in about five minutes. Um, moving on, Form API. What is Form API? No. Form API allows developers to build and validate and submit forms in Drupal. And this is the form interface for every form that you go to in Drupal. This is the interface behind the form. It just, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's build, validate, and submit. These functions, these methods exist, and you kind of build all your forms off. Any form you go to in Drupal is going to work off of the form API, unless you actually want to work around the form API, which almost no one does. Um, what's also behind form API is these render arrays. And render arrays, this, <laughs> I hate this description, but it's the, on Drupal.org, so I'm going to read it. Hierarchical associative array containing data to be rendered and properties describing how the data should be rendered. Um, render arrays represent things. It's a way in PHP to describe what you want to output. This is an example of the site logo from one of the base themes in Drupal where you have a theme property, say you want to render an image, and you're giving it a URI and the alt text. Um, we'll get more into render arrays. And now, I also need to address Field API. Now, the YAML form module is using form API, but there's back and forth questions why I'm not using field API. So I want to walk through what field API is. Um, here's the definition of field API. Field API allows site builders to architect and present type data associated with a content entity. Um, this is the backbone of Drupal. This is what nodes are. Any piece of content, anything you do in Drupal is using field API. They're content entities with fields added to it and it allows you to build amazing websites. 
Um, I describe it as architect and present. That's like the, the that's what Field API opens up to developers. Um, and kind of I want to talk about the comparison of Form API to Field API. Form API is a low-level API in Drupal that just allows you to build forms, collect data and submissions, and for me in the YAML form module is to just download the data as a spreadsheet. Field API is this rich system to architect websites with a whole system for rendering the, the fields and the content you want, and it builds web pages, and then you get into views, which allows you to take that data and do anything you want within, it, within a website. Um, they're really two different systems, and Field API is very robust, but it's also complex. Because um, there's some discussion about using Field API to build forms, and I think Drupal will get there, but there's this problem, and this, this image describes the problem. Um, it's a rocket car. Like, Field API is this incredibly powerful system, but it just doesn't make it easy to build simple forms. It's actually pretty complex, so you have to understand a whole bunch of different concepts. What, what, how fields work, what a form display is, what different display modes, how views works. The views interface is overwhelming to senior developers who get into it. I still don't know every feature in it. Um, so this is kind of where YAML form comes in. And what is YAML form? It's a wrapper around form API and render arrays that provides a fluid user experience for building forms and collecting data. So this concept of fluid user experience came from someone else posting in some issue queue about how much they liked YAML form. They said it's just a fluid user experience. And I really found that important because that summarizes what I've been after. It's build something that just works. You install it and you build a form and it's easy to use and you kind of get it out of the box. You don't have to go and read a ton of documentation to get started. Um, so to back up, the backbone of the YAML form module is YAML, using YAML to kind of represent what a form is. And what we're seeing here is just a contact form with a name, email, subject, describes what the fields are, there's a text area for the message. And I've done this presentation before, so people, some people are familiar with this, but the next thing that I'm gonna show is what the YAML form has become, which now has a full UI to build forms. So you don't have to know YAML to build forms, but I'm keeping the name around for a little while because the backbone of this is this YAML array, YAML representing the entire form. And I'm gonna demo this a little bit more in a second. Um, so why use YAML forms? This is the use case. This is the use case I'm after. It's on the project page. It's, it's just about building a form, publishing the form as a page note or block on the site, collecting the data, sending some confirmations, notifications, an email, or publishing to some other site. You review the data and you download it. It's a very simple workflow. It even is as simple as build, collect, and download. It's, that's what I boil down the goal of the module. When I make decisions, it kind of tries to fall into these three categories. Um, so some cool, unique features, because this is the other form builder. Um, YAML form definitely has decent, it has like 90% feature parity with web forms in D7. Um, most, it, and I'll demo a lot of the features and people are familiar with them, but I wanted to call out some unique features, especially because I'm gonna do a demo and I wanna call out things that are, are unique or new. The biggest one is for me, you can edit the source. For a developer, it saves a huge amount of time. That means you can type out a form in plain text and if you know how forms work in Drupal, it's the fastest way to build a form because you can also cut and paste snippets of code and put it together. Um, one other feature going through them kind of qu quickly is you have starter templates, so it helps you get started. So you can just build the template and copy it over and over again for example, like a job application, and it's gonna ship with a whole bunch of examples so people can kind of see all the capabilities. Um, and there's a whole bunch of custom and composite components, a composite component's basically an address field. It just makes it easy to say, I wanna collect an address and custom, you'll start to see some example. And Flexbox layouts is a really interesting one. It means you can do multi-column forms, and it, Flexbox is a web technology, it's browser-based, there's nothing custom to it, it's supported by all the modern browsers except IE9, which I love how that works out, but that's less than 2%. Um, and submission handler plugin, that just means an abstract way to collect data and do anything you want with it. And customizable results table, I'm gonna just demo, and reusable list options, I'll demo, and I'm gonna start showing you some things in the module. And I'm gonna take a sip of water. So, the module's installed um, on my local machine, it, it comes with a bunch of sub-modules. There's a main YAML form module that just is basically the API, and there's a Devel module to kind of add some development tools, and then it ships with some examples, and I kind of, there's been some blog posts about Drupal should ship with examples, and I think that's a really important thing to have for people 
learning new modules. So it just installs a bunch of example forms so you can look at what the module is actually capable of instead of trying to figure it out. Um, and then the YAML form module comes with some node integration, which I will demo. And templates is this idea of these forms you can, starter forms. They're kind of examples, but you're meant to copy them and then build other forms off of it. And then there's the UI. The UI has been abstracted out so that it actually can develop more over time so we can improve it and make it maybe more drag and drop based. There's some, some hopeful improvements I can make in the future. Um, so a big change recently for anyone who saw it is I actually removed the word YAML form from anywhere in Drupal. It's called forms because <laughs> that's what it builds. There's some back and forth about the name. If you're not a developer, you don't know what YAML is. So it just installs in the structure, um, under structure as forms. It's forms and submissions, which kind of makes sense. Um, I'm going to do a demo of a contact form because I think people are very familiar with it. Like this is a standard copy of the contact form. I used it so that people coming into Drupal, they've looked at the contact module, they've installed it, they know what a contact form is. Um, it does ship with a test tab so you can quickly generate tests. And it can generate test data for any type of um, form that you, you build, which really makes it easy to test things. And now I'm going to jump into the UI. And I'm going to just demo the UI and not get too into details. But I'm going to, the example I like to illustrate is, we need to add a company field to this form or company element. So you click add element, and then you have a text field. Now this, I'm doing one-handed, but hey, I can manage. Type company. It ships with a ton of default settings. And there's this helpful thing to expand and collapse. Um, so it just expanded all the settings. So you can, you don't need to, by the way, one thing about the M form, it ships with sensible defaults. You don't need to fill out anything else on this form to get an element to work. You just need to say what the title is. Um, but you have control over everything from the display, all the standard stuff that you're familiar with with forms from, um, you can even do MPMS. And I'm gonna demo this a little bit more as I move on. But I'm just gonna add the field to the form. It goes to the bottom and I can give you a preview. And there's two problems here. It's at the bottom, it's not required. Um, so this checkbox makes it nice and easy to just move it up, put it under, your name. And now th there is a problem here. Um, it says company when it really should say your company to go with the flow of the form and the way the labeling is. And this is where I wanted to show you the source mode. So in the source mode, you can edit the entire form. So you're getting a preview of the whole form. Um, some good examples here is if we said, well, we don't want it required, you can go and take that out. You can even start cop cutting and pasting different fields to build it out. I hit save. Go back into test, and now we have a new form with your company not required. So that's the form building experience, and now I'm gonna jump into what's, what's going on in the background. So if I go into results, we're collecting the results. This is very, by the way, I did, I looked at WebForm, I copied a lot of the patterns in WebForm because people are familiar with it. Also, they make sense. A lot of energy was spent to be like, okay, you give a, submit, a list of all the submissions coming in, here's all the data that you need to see. Um, two improvements that are clearly here is you can flag submissions by checking off a star. So it just gives you a quick way for this is, I reviewed it, this is an important submission. You can also add notes to the submission, like add, oops, sorry, let's see a jump. You can add admin notes and just start adding some notes to the submission. And these get exported as well. Um, and then there's a table view, and people are very familiar with this with web forms where you can see everything that's coming in. Um, one of the things I did decide to do was I don't have a lot of views integration yet, but you can actually customize this table. It's kind of, I would describe it as a light views, where you can go in and customize this view to just pull the fields that you want. So for example, if I just want to look at the submission information, I can hit save. You can actually control the sorting, the number of results per page, what the headers look like. And now you get a compressed report. And this is customized for every single instance of YAML forms, and you can save it, and you can share it. Um, it's not using views. It's just a really simple, lightweight way to look at your data. And then, similar to YAML forms, you can download all the data into a spreadsheet. Um, one big addition is you can download your files. Um, it'll, it'll create an archive of all the uploaded files and give it to you in a zip. Um, any questions before I, because this is a lot. This is like an overwhelming flow of information. Um, Mm -hmm. is, is that part of YAML or part of the, part of the form? It's part, the, YAML, the YAML form module ships with, a, at this point, eight um, e external plugins that need to be 
installed. There's a Drush command to install all of them, so you have to install Code Mirror. But by the way, you don't actually have to install them. It has CDN integration, so out of the box, the YAML module just works for someone who's not familiar with Drush. It goes out to the CDNs and loads the library. Um, there's no Code Mirror integration in Drupal, and I don't know if the Code Mirror module got moved, ported to D8. Um, my take is trying to just make, it, I'm trying not to make too many dependencies. I'm just trying to get it to work. I just feel like that's the easier approach. And as Drupal 8 evolves, maybe these will spin off into the Code Mirror library, but it also gives me a lot of control over these elements. Um, for example, the Code Mirror one has some custom validation to make sure the YAML is actually valid. And you don't get that out of the Code Mirror plugin. So the Code Mirror is just part of uh, the core of YAML. Other forms of Drupal have their own control. Oh. So I'm interested in, so the Code Mirror does not affect the rest of the site, is what I'm asking, or does it? No, it doesn't go throughout the site. No, it doesn't do Code Mirror integration, but it does, as I demo through, you'll see that you ha actually can put a code mirror element on your form, because it's all form, like I created a code mirror form element in Drupal, and you can reuse that in your forms as you're building it out. Um, so then maybe, uh, maybe you should show code mirror. I don't know that everybody knows what that is. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. Uh, let me jump to that. I think that's a good way to lead forward, move forward. Um, so it ships with a bunch of examples, and what Eric's asking about is like, it ships with a kitchen sink example of every element that's supported. So anything in core that you're familiar with is automatically supported. The examples, basic elements, checkboxes, text area, text fields, but then you can do autocomplete. It also comes with caption integration. If you install the caption module, that's picked up, and it has code mirror integration. And, and code mirror is just like an I, a lightweight IDE widget to edit markup. So you, it, it ships with, you can do YAML markup or um, XML, XML, HTML. Um, and then it also does, I'm gonna, I'll walk through some of them, is a lot of HTML5 integration. That's just the, this is just the HTML5 color widget. Um, I'm adding fields as I see necessary, if they make sense, and I've used them in the past, and I've done a lot of form building in other projects. I'm, I'm trying to create as many fields as possible that someone might use. Um, and there's actually known issues being documented. And then I've actually gotten into a lot of the custom elements. And I'm also looking outside of Drupal to see what's going on in the form builder community, like what's going on in WooFu, Cognito Forms, SurveyMonkey, and trying to get some of those be elements into Drupal or into just this form builder because people are using them and I kind of want people to adopt Drupal. So I want to be like, yes, it's easy to have a rating element. It's not a big deal. Um, it's easy to have a signature element. And this is very useful for applications. It's, and my experience is you go to the library, you install the library, if you pick the right library and it's well documented, it's not a big deal to add these elements in. Um, this is actually just integrating with Drupal's um, WYSIWYG editor that's built in. I added a toggle element because I'm seeing a lot of people starting to use it because checkboxes kind of suck. <laughs> um, and then we're getting into, these are composite fields, so it's just an easier way to add addresses. And one of the nicest features, I ha someone asked me to do this, is um, there's a, plugin called GeoComplete, which integrates with Google, and it gives you full autocomplete on addresses. And so this text just got filled out, but in the background it pulled all the metadata to this address, including longitude, latitude, locality. And they even made me take it a step further where they wanted uh, geoencoding in the background. So you can actually hide this element, put it on your form, and it will just populate with the geolocation of whoever's submitting the form. It does prompt people, because of security, says, would you like to share your address? But in certain use cases, people just want that information for student applications or like surveys or something like that. Um, and moving forward, it's, it's, it's like we did a lot of entity reference um, elements so you can get full references to nodes and stuff like that and you can display it as an autocomplete, checkboxes and selects. File uploads, are no, a quick interesting, this is just like a Drupalism. I don't think anyone knows this. Out of core, the file upload field ships with bulk file uploads where you can go and select 10 files are on your machine and it'll automatically upload it. It's, it's, it's just not being used anywhere and someone just pointed it out to me and they're like, you know it supports that and it was very easy to add it. Um, the other thing that's really common is Likert support so I did put a lot of energy into that. Um, moving on, this, this is an overwhelming amount of stuff so if anyone has questions, I'll, I'll Hi, uh, very interesting presentation. We chatted a bit about your MSK expertise, and this is um, a public-facing, you use this for public-facing websites. So my question is, do you foresee that this could have use, utility 
in terms of a wearable medical device, in terms of uh, an app for that? This is just collecting data, so it depends on what people are trying to do with it. Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of use in medical. I'm seeing a lot of use in medical because people have these very complex forms and they need to collect a lot of information. So I'm seeing a lot of people posting, and they're like these hundred input forms that are collecting someone's full medical history. And, and the other part is, they don't necessarily need that medical history to go into Drupal. They just need a form on a website that then gets pushed somewhere else. Um, and this module works really well for that. Oh, great. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, this is quick. Uh, conditions and conditional. Yes, um, I will just show you. I, I think that's a better way to do this. You ask a question, I can actually answer, but yes. So. Conditional logic right now is using Drupal state a State's API. This is an out-of-the-box API that's front-end facing where it allows you to do <coughs> conditional logic, which is hide and show things based on behavior. So I'm just walking through a couple of them. Um, there is a UI for it, and I'll show the UI. Here's the UI. It's very simple. It, it's it's, it, by the way, this is trying to simplify Drupal State's API so it's kind of readable. So you can say, what's the state you want? I'll just quickly walk you through. You can hide, by the way, I don't love the language. This, is, this module is extending Drupal's form API, so I'm not trying to change how Drupal describes hiding and showing. They use visible and invisible, so I decided to stick with it. Um, but you can do all these different states, and then you can say whether, what are the conditions, the element selectors that you'd want. Um, is that editable in YAML? Um, yes, um, and if you, so this is a light, how you put, this is covering, that UI covers like 75% of what State's API is capable of. If you want to get crazy and do these really bizarre nested conditions that I've never personally used, it actually defaults back to YAML. But yes, when you're doing that, it builds out this stuff. This is State's API, and it does it in the background, and it's very simple. Um, to give a hint here, one of the things that have worked out in the YAML4 module is, I can actually parse this state's API definition, and I'm hoping to, I'm, I'm going to get server-side conditional logic. I got 10 minutes? Uh, good. I can, I can live with that. Um, so that's, yes, yeah, state's API. Go. Um, given that uh, it, it seems very similar to web forms, mm -hmm. um, and one of the problems with web forms that I've always found, and I'm not sure how you dealt with it, uh, here is um, you, you're saving the output in a table or in tables yeah. rather than is there an API to say, I want to shortcut this, I want a callback when, on the submit handler, and I want to send this because this is a PII and I can't store okay. it in my database. So, yeah, I, I mean, this is like I could just do a dozen questions. Um, yes, I'm going to show you the contact form. So. We're looking at this form and it's just sending emails. And there's, these are abstract plugins that you attach to your form to say, I wanted to send an email, I want to send a notification. You can turn off the results so it never hits Drupal. It never gets stored in the database. And then you can create handlers to push the data to other places. And someone just created an issue um, for a, what was he calling it? it? It's called like a post request, request post handler. And I'm going to add that hopefully in the next week or so. So what it's going to do is take the data and just push it to whichever web URL you, you specify. Um, and then the other one I would like to do is get it into Google Sheets at some point. So it would push the data out of Drupal into Google Sheets. Um, any other questions? Go. So I saw you had an address uh, form yeah. element. Are you, did you build your own or are you, like Commerce Guys recently re released their address library for international address validation with an address um, form field? No. I'm not, I'm, I'm doing the, well, the, the location, the address is just plain text fields that you just kind of, you know, it, it, and I can actually show you the, um, the UI for it. Uh, give me one second. No. Um, the location stuff I'm using Google's API because I just felt like that was better. I'm not trying, the, the problem is with a lot of stuff in core is it's, in, it's focused on field API. So it's not as easy to hook into and write code and test it. Um, and so a lot of occasions I'll just build it from scratch. And it's, it's like evaluating how long is it going to take me and what's the level of test coverage I can get for this custom element. And sorry that I'm not seeing. Oh, here. So the UI for it is really just a series of text fields that you can control and you can say which ones you want and change the labeling and translations and stuff like that. 
Um, other questions? Go. Um, yeah, I'm curious about the accessibility aspect of this. Um, you, sh you showed some components like a signature element that I'm wondering if, if that's um, like WCAG compliant. And I wouldn't know. And like on that element, I wouldn't know, and it might not be. And that's like, I, I, one of the ways these are written is you can sub out, you can kind of take that library and replace it with something else. Um, everything's, most of the widgets are based off a of core, so they're going to work as you would expect. Um, the third party ones, like the toggle and stuff, it, I wouldn't, yeah, it depends. I think someone would have to do an audit and kind of put a ticket in on which ones are or not, and we would document right. it and then decide. And we could put warnings in and tell people not to use certain elements if it's not. And um, do you have control over the markup completely? Like if you wanted to add a field set to a certain group of um, form items, can you do that with, um, with YAML just? Yes, you have a lot. Wait, the output, you have an incredible amount of control. I can actually demo some quick things with it. Um, and there's a lot of template. These are all core elements. So you can override the templates in core. Like these pick up your form styles. Um, but the YAML form module has um, an example for basic layout. And this is just showing you some of the quick things you can do by just controlling it. And um, this example here where I'm tucking this in a warning box is just adding, I'll just show you the UI. It's adding a couple of classes to the container. So I've just adjusted the markup. So if you create your own styles and classes, you can kind of just apply them to the form. Um, the other thing about layout, and this is getting into the layout, I, I think it's just worth quickly showing people the Flexbox layout. You can do multi-column forms. You can do any type of layout you want, and it's responsive where it starts to collapse when you get down to lower. So you can do compress your forms. This is helpful for long forms. I personally don't like multi-column forms. I find them harder to use. But if you have 100 fields, I think it can help with the user experience, or if you want to keep everything on one page. Any other questions? Yeah, yes. So this is where I, I'm just like, you're just walking me through my demo. It's just much easier to do it this way because then people are like, okay. Yes, full multi-page support. Um, this is just an example of it. I'm gonna, I can actually, testing will fill out all the fields. And you can walk through with the preview. It does save as draft. It is basically web form compatibility. The thing that is missing is conditional logic on pages. And that's something I was just planning on adding at some point. It's a pain in the neck, but it, it, it can make a big difference. Um, and there's a preview and apply. Any other questions? So this is a bit tangential, but where did you, what PowerPoint module did you use with those lovely rockets? And <laughs> That's just Google Slides and I just found the deck. Oh. It's like you can just slide temp, Google Slides free templates and there's a whole community out there building templates for free, so. It's really cool. Yeah, I was kind of happy with it. It solved, <laughs> I didn't have to think about it. Um, yeah, we've just covered every example. So that's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up and just quickly say templates. It, basically, it's just a starting point. And you have control. You can create your own templates for your clients and give them starters to work off of. Um, and then the, a big shift from web forms is this is config. These are dedicated forms to collect data. The submissions are content. But you can add forms to your site. There's a, it comes with a YAML form node module. And I'll just go to. Here, so it's a content type, um, contact. You can go in and specify the form. Hit save and publish. And as soon as you do this behavior, it kicks in all the tabs and you get a test tab. And here's where it gets kind of interesting is, okay, I'm submitting, making a submission from here on the node, there's a node on your site. If I go to results, you're gonna see that, I, by the way, we've submitted this form two or three times already. You're only gonna see one result here because it's tracking where the result's coming from, so you're only seeing results from this form. So it actually opens up this possibility of reusing forms in really interesting ways. So you could create, a classic use case is an event registration form. You have events on your site, you take this one form and you attach it to all the events, and it knows which events people are registering for. And that what I had hinted before, well I didn't hint, but I, you guys see this, you can actually add also some metadata to that single registration, or you can pass in through tokens information about the specific event into that form. So it makes your forms a lot more reusable. And there's some really interesting use cases. The other one that kind of blew me away was someone was doing a application process. So they had a job application form, people were filling it out, and then they attached another form to the result of this form, 
and they basically created an evaluation system. So the form they attach is evaluate this person, and they're able to track who get evaluations on one single submission. So um, it has opened up a lot of possibilities on that. Um, and blocks are also, you can attach any form to a block on the site, and it does the same behavior. Anywhere you submit this form from a block, it knows where it was submitted from. So it's doing some, I call it a source entity, so it's tracking it. Um, and it, it's a real entity reference, so it opens up, you can pull any data from that page um, into your submission. Any other questions? Mike? Oh, I get to drink. Um, you were showing the template. Um, mm -hmm. Tab, can you just walk through that real quick? Sure. It's, <laughs> it's really a matter of, like, um, back up. All right, we're here. So it, it's, I actually did a lot of refactoring on this a few times. So you can preview the template. So let's talk job application. So this is the job application template. You can select it. And then it actually gives you, the machine name behind, in the background of these, temp, these templates is like template underscore job application. So I stripped that out. So for the first time, I don't have to do anything. I just hit save. And now it's just copied the form and gave me a starting point to work off of. Uh, I'm hoping that this module is shipped with a dozen templates that are common use cases for different applications. Um, I think it'll make a big difference when people are coming in because you can, and you could, by the way, it's all customizable because once it's imported, it's yours. So you can go in and say, I want to tweak the job application, have a slightly different look and feel. What? What level? Where? Well, there's this handler, and a lot of people are starting to use it. It's called a YAML form. It's a YAML form. Oh, how, um, I'd like to encrypt the data as it's coming through. So the, the fact that um, everything's abstracted, and I'll actually just walk you through, like, really. So everything's abstracted in these handlers when handling the data. S submissions ready, the results, the saving of results, that's some hard-coded stuff that you can turn off which is important because some people don't want to save stuff in Drupal, but these handlers are available for you to customize and extend, and I'm going to add one simple handler to this form. It's a debug handler, and it's just going to give you like a hint on how easy it is to manipulate this data. And if I go to test, I'm going to run the test, and basically this handler, aka plugin, gives you the data. <laughs> and here's the data, and you can do anything you want with it. Uh, some people are passing it to other systems to encrypt, so you could have a system behind a firewall send it to that. Encrypting it into Drupal, like the submission data, there's right now no hooks to do that. Uh, well, I take that back. They're actual, okay, submissions are entities. You can do anything you want to an entity. So you could encrypt the data going in and out easily. So you could put some hashing on that data and salt it. Um, by the way, I think there'd be a module for that. Like I think there'd be a module to encrypt content entities as they're going into the database. Other questions? Actually, I have a question. Um, I saw that uh, you have the geo autocomplete mm -hmm. field. Is there another option where you can import data from other um, data points? Like, for example, if I copy and paste a field that's already an API, is there a way to like import it by based on the um, URL of the API? Wait, like to import. Like, for example, in a library, if we want to fill in um, some book data with inside Drupal, mm -hmm. we already have book data that we can import into. It's there like a, an option where I could just paste and call a service, a microservice, saying that the book data is already here, and then autofill the um, form fields. Yes. That, I mean, that's important. Like, there's, a, there's like, I've lost track of the number of ways to manipulate the form as it's going in. So you can have this YAML. You can basically go type in the YAML of the data you want. You could use tokens. You can pass in query string parameters, and you actually have to turn that on. Um, there's a huge amount of settings. This is important. Right? The module ships with sensible defaults, but you can customize everything. And this gives you, I'm just going to walk you to the settings page and be like, this specific setting that you're talking about. I'm going to expand all. By the way, this expand all makes a big difference because it makes it easy. If you know what you're doing, you can jump to it. But I'm just going to scroll slowly and walk through some of these things. This is disabling the submissions. You have full control of the page. And then if we scroll down here, you get in these nice little checkboxes. Some of them are really juicy. Um, this is allow elements to be pre-populated using query string data. So you could just pass in. You could have somewhere else on your site and kind of pass in some extra data. 
and then I actually put a lot of energy into the usability, so you can dis disable client-side HTML5 validation, which has some accessibility issues. Um, you can do autofocus on the first element, which, wow, does that speed up? A f I, I'm shocked that Drupal is not doing that for a lot of the node edit forms and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, you're getting into all the settings here of the wizard. Confirmate, you have full submission limits on, you know, user submission limits per node submission limits. Confirmations, it's been extended a little bit more than web, um, web forms. You can control almost every aspect of the confirmation, whether you're redirecting, showing custom text. Um, and then it also tracks who's the author. And that, there's a tab here where there is full access controls. So you can say who can edit what submissions, where, and do it that way. More questions? Yeah, how about a JSON to uh, YAML converter and back and forth? How would I do that? What, for a form or for yeah, data? Well, to, form, to pull data in so you, can, so you can modify the data and push it back out. Well, right now, the, the hooks are bring data in, like that's gonna come up more and more, like there's gotta be some import mechanisms to YAML form, especially if people are coming from web form. Like there's gotta be a CSV import that's gonna have to happen in some web services integration. Um, that's still, you know, like I'm not at that phase because I'm focusing on building the UI, um, but I think that's in the pipeline. I, I'm somewhat doing a D6 to D8 web form to YAML form migration. They just started working on it. I'm out of time. Just about. Two more questions. Really? Yeah. Go for it. No, I don't have any questions. Oh. I'm saying two more questions. Well, I'm going to, okay. I'm going to go to this slide so I can just point out. As you're moving over there, these are the, there's a lot of activity in the issue queue. These are the um, six things that kind of I'm going to call out as in the future some better views integration, the conditional logic, the templates, third party integration. I want to improve the UX. Um, and actually, there's this ticket, and it, it's going to take a few months, but there's going to be this potential to do some field API integration where a YAML form would populate an entity, would it pass its data, maybe act as a front end. I'm still not totally sure of the approach. And just to explain, some people know this issue, but the big issue is field API can't handle really long forms, like 100 fields, it falls apart. And I'm throwing around this idea of a hybrid solution where YAML form handles the 100 fields, and 10 of those fields go into a node or a YAML form submission, so that then you could do views on that key piece of data. Because most surveys, you don't need fields for every piece of data. You just need a couple of pieces of data to do your, you know, your analytics and stuff like that. Um, and yeah. Oh, and this kind of leads, I think the use case is going to go to what your, people are hinting at, like distributing the data, like where can we push this data to, how can we add, extend it? And that's it. Right. And I said no more. We're good. All right, we're good. You can ask me questions later. Of course. All right. That was awesome. There's a lot, there's a lot of options in there, huh? Oh, wait. Where's my clicker? It's all the way back there. Hold on. I can't move forward without my clicker. Let's see. I wonder what's coming up next. All right. Well, first of all, thank you, Jacob. That was great, Jake. Um, let's move on. Mai, our, our very own Mai, one of our uh, uh, trusty organizers, is going to talk about um, Drupal, whatever, Drupal 8 uh, Media and all the fun goings on that are happening in Drupal 8 Media. So I'm going to stall for a minute while she plugs in her computer. Um, Rockefeller Bil Center was built in 1939. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, I'm hoping that it's going to go real quick before we're all plugged in, because then I'm um, just, no, other side, other side. Oh, okay. There you go. Huh? We announced drinks, right? 51st, uh, 51st Street is the entrance, Bill's Bar. It might be at the, the upstairs bar, it might be at the downstairs bar. You never know. So if you don't see anyone you recognize, go to the other bar. And we're good. All right, Mai, take it away. OK. All right. So welcome to the somewhat incomplete overview of the media com components in Drupal 8. Um, I'm my Irie. I'm a software architect at Phase 2. And uh, there's a lot to cover here. Um, and I'm certainly not going to cover everything as the title slide indicated. Um, I'm going to be probably moving rather quickly. Um, but my goal is to 
provide an entry point um, so you know what's going on in core and you have some kind of information on what's happening in the contrib space and where to find out uh, additional information. So one of the key areas uh, for Drupal 8 um, was uh, media management. Um, and this was so that, uh, you know, Drupal could be more competitive in the CMS space, right? There's a lot of better options out there in terms of like how assets are being and handled in, within a CMS and the experience for editors. So I'm gonna talk about first what's new in Drupal um, 8 core. So first off, we have this file tab that's part of the content administration interface. It doesn't look that new, but this doesn't exist in 7 um, from core. Um, this is located at slash admin slash content slash files, and uh, you can update it. Um, it's, I believe it's controlled by a view. Um, and then we have this WYSIWYG, let me try to make that bigger, WYSIWYG integration. So we have the ability to add inline images um, and some defaults that, I'm sorry, default meta tag, meta data type, tag, uh, type fields, like alt text, and caption, and alignment. Um, and these are supported by these data attributes. Um, as Jake was mentioning earlier, there's the drag and drop kind of option um, and the multi-upload uh, for file fields, which I will show in a second. Um, this is accomplished by the, uh, the pound multiple attribute um, that's in the form API. Um, and it's implemented for image and file fields. And the markup um, for the form element is using that HTML5 uh, multiple attribute. Let me get out of that. Exit full screen. Don't play again. Okay. Uh, let me make this big again. Sorry about that. Um, Another thing that is available in core, it's not enabled by default, is um, responsive images. Um, so this is an optional module that's available. It's pretty, pretty hot, um, I would say. Uh, basically, the idea is, um, you know, you would enable this with the breakpoint module, which is both, both options were available in contrib and D7, but now they're part of core. You can enable it. I highly recommend enabling it and trying it out, um, playing around with it. But the idea is that um, this module is providing different image styles for individual images uh, based on the dev device size and the breakpoint. So it's providing um, an image formatter and breakpoint mappings. Um, and, you know, it's either going to output um, using the HTML5 uh, picture element or if you're supplying multiple image styles based on different sizes, you're probably, you're, it's going to be using the source set and sizes attributes. Um, if you want to provide your own breakpoints um, with your custom theme, you can um, set that up um, by adding a breakpoints.yaml file, and uh, those Breakpoints that you're defining in your YAML file are going to be available in on the configuration page for your responsive images. So, I mean, the basic idea here um, is to solve the following problem. So we're building responsive websites, right? Um, and a lot of times we're just using CSS. So this is giving us this extra kind of um, option to let the browser decide how to provide these images. So let me just take a step back here. So, you know, a lot of times we have, you know, our CSS, and we have our media queries, and it's wonderful, and our images are like sized for the largest breakpoint, right? Because we want that max width in our parent container. But on mobile devices, this is a pretty large payload. And then, you know, in the opposite world, 
if we were optimizing for mobile and like being like, all right, we want the smallest image, and we were having our images, you know, fill up the width of the parent container, we would have this problem. So responsive images is not something that's Drupal specific. This is kind of an HTML uh, markup option where we're saying, hey, browser, can you decide like which image to serve the user? So what does this markup look like? Um, so first of all, um, and I'm just sh I'm showing you the one with the source set and sizes. Um, the picture element is, is kind of a little bit different, but this one is kind of interesting to walk through. So we've got the fallback image, um, and then we're saying to the browser, hey, these are the different images that I have, and here's the width. And instead of writing pixels, we're writing W. Um, and then in the sizes attribute, we're saying, okay, these are the breakpoints when the image width needs to change. Um, and the, it's going from the first match that is selected, so it's going from largest to smallest. And notice this VW here, this is the percentage of the viewport width. So this is the, the view, viewport, not its parent container or anything, because this is a viewport width. So just keep that in mind. So I want to walk through some of the configuration here. So first of all, where is it? Um, it's in under configuration media responsive images. Um, and then uh, the responsive image module ships with a couple default image styles and some responsive image style settings. Um, so we're going to take a look at the narrow one. So we can see that we have the breakpoint groups. Let me see if I can walk over here. So we have this breakpoint group here, and then um, you have options to kind of like do some additional configuration for 1x, 1.5x, 2x. Here we're keeping it simple. This is just the default kind of setup for narrow coming from a responsive image. But you can see the select multiple image styles um, is selected. So this is going back to that markup that we're seeing. So this is a setup that's going to match up with this markup. Um, so, uh, if we scroll down a bit, we're saying, hey, these are the sizes where, you know, this is my expected viewport width that the image should take up, and here are the image styles that I want you to use. And then we have that fallback image. So, if you wanted to use this responsive image uh, style for um, an image field, like on a content type, for example, um, we're going to just walk through that real quick. So this is article, we're going to manage display. And basically you are selecting the responsive image format. And once you do that, you're given additional options. And you select which responsive image style group that you want to use. So let's see this in action so we can see our markup here. Very similar, it's, it's a lot going on. Um, I am going to just show the network tab so you can see how the browser is requesting these images. Um, and I'm going to be reloading the page here so we can start fresh. So on the first uh, this viewport width, we are requesting this image. If I expand it, you see the browser is requesting the next one that it requires for this viewport width. And if I continue expanding it, you know, the browser is again requesting that. So that's, that's basically how it kind of works um, in action. So if you wanted to use a rendable array, um, this is what it looks like. Uh, you have the type of responsive image. You're telling it where the image is located, the URI. And then you're saying, hey, this is the machine name for the responsive image style uh, that I want you to use. So there's tons that you can do here. Um, there, here are some resources to help you figure out what sizes you'll need for your images, uh, for your different breakpoints, how to serve different images for the 1x, 1.5x, 2x um, resolutions. And then you can do additional things um, with art direction in mind. So if you want to have like a different image crop or focal point for like mobile, versus desktop, you can totally do it. The browser doesn't care. You're basically telling the browser, hey, use this image at this breakpoint. 
Um, so that's pretty awesome just from core alone. So now we're going to get into what's going on in the contrib space. Um, so to kind of like walk through this a bit, we should probably have a little recap on how we dealt with media in D7. Um, a lot of us relied on media, module, and friends. Maybe you use Scald or Acid or MediaBox. But I'm going to be specifically talking about media, um, the media module, because the file entity uh, module is going to, is relevant to the conversation. So like, first of all, are you, how many of you guys are familiar with the media module in 7? OK, cool. So for, for those of you who, um, who aren't, uh, basically what the idea behind the media module was to provide uh, a two-tiered API. So one being a resource manager that was creating a unified uh, media storage, and then the other being an extensible browser for editors. So having this API allowed us to like kind of not reinvent the wheel um, for the different kind of media, um, asset, the types of media assets out there. But you know, like you could um, use uh, uh, an asset that was a file that was uploaded locally, or you could reference kind of like a remote file, like a YouTube video. Um, so this is the idea behind this. So if we look at the stack, um, first off, from Drupal 7 core, we've got these stream wrappers and this file entities. The file entity module is extending that. Um, it's providing um, an additional kind of API to round out what core is providing, making them fieldable, providing view modes, um, you know, providing this UI to kind of manage these file entities. And the media module is kind of com supporting all of these four layers, bringing these four layers together um, and providing that extensible uh, UI for the browser. And you know, providing that WYSIWYG integration, field widgets, et cetera. So if we look at what's happening in D8, um, we have both file entity and this other entity called media entity um, in the contrib space. And these are two different media storage solutions in, uh, available in D8. Um, it took me a little bit to kind of understand what was going on here. So that's why I wanted to kind of like walk through this piece um, to give you kind of like a quick, like what's the difference between these two, what's going on. Um, keep in mind that both of these storage solutions work with uh, the other components in the media uh, ecosystem. So like this is because the whole idea was to have these decoupled components uh, rather than a monolithic solution. So. Both will generally work okay with like entity browser, which I'll cover in a bit, or the uh, entity embed button, which I'll also cover here. Um, but, okay, so what is file entity? Again, just like when I was showing you that media seven, Drupal 7 stack, it's extending from the Drupal core file entity, and it's basically treating everything like a file. And then with, um, there's also this kind of remote storage solution for files called Fly System um, that I just want to mention real quick. So if you want to store your files like on an Amazon S3 bucket, um, you might use Fly System. Fly System is providing this kind of um, interface that's using this uh, Fly this PHP library called Fly System, and you know it's basically kind of tr treating everything like private files. Uh, in, in DA. But let's get back to Media Entity here. So Media Entity is another storage solution. Um, the idea is that it's not assuming that all of your media assets are files, and it's bringing to the table this new entity type called Media. So as I mentioned before, both of these, Media and File Entity, are designed to work with the other components in the D8 Media Initiative. So that's pretty awesome. If you, but I'm going to be focusing on media entity uh, because that's kind of different. That's new in the D8 space. File entity stuff is going to be pretty similar to what you were seeing in Seven because it's extending from the uh, the core file entity um, type. But 
if you were going to use media entity, um, you need that media entity um, dependency. And then there are other options. Say you wanted to have audio support or documents, images, Instagram embeds or Twitter embeds, video, you know, those are available. So that's kind of like what that landscape looks like. So let's take an example media bundle and kind of explore. So I, for this example, I'm going to explore through um, the tweet media bundle that's provided by uh, this, the Lightning uh, distribution. Now Lightning in D8 is a lot different from D7 version. It's a lot more lightweight, but um, that's, a, that's, a side, that's a side issue. So going back to the media bundle. So where is it? Um, it's under structure, media bundles, and um, we are going to explore tweet. So if we look at it, we've got the type provider Twitter, and then our tweet embed code is going to go in that field tweet. That was pretty fast, but it's okay. Um, and if we look at what the tweet embed code is, it's just a plain long text field. And then when we are displaying this, it's using this Twitter embed uh, format that is provided by um, the uh, media entity Twitter module. So we just walked through like a setup of a, a example media bundle. Let's talk about how we would use it. So some options here, you can browse or add these tweets uh, to your system using something called like an entity browser. And then you can embed these, you can connect your entity browser with um, a nice little button that you can have in your WYSIWYG toolbar using something called the entity embed. So entity browser, notice I'm saying entity. So this is not media specific, but we're, we're talking media here, but you could embed any entity, like a, a node entity, right? Um, uh, and, I'm sorry, not embed, browse. Um, and also create. Um, so this is a flexible and generic browse and selection tool. Um, there are already some additional kind of default contrib, contrib like modules out there that are providing these kind of setups uh, for the entity browser. An example is content browser. Another example is file browser. This is bringing in this drag and drop um, library for bulk upload. Uh, with it, but how does the entity browser work? Now, this is a rather intense diagram. I'm going to walk through it. All right, so first off, the entity browser is a configuration entity. It's bringing together, it's gluing together these four plugins. So the first one that we're going to walk through is browser display. Um, so this is how uh, the browser is displaying to the editor. So you have an iframe, you have a modal window. If you were um, you know, pushing content to a third party system, you might use a standalone form. Um, so that's the first thing that you would configure. Um, and then the next thing um, are these, ent well, let me skip to entity browser widgets, because this is over here. This is how you would be selecting and browsing these entities on your system. So you might use a view, right? Or you, if you're uploading you know, files from your computer, you might use the file upload widget. Or you might use the inline entity form to create these entities there. You might roll your own. These are plugins. Um, next up, we have this entity browser widget selection. Um, which is like how you are, you know, if you have multiple options for how an editor is going to be selecting these entities, um, maybe you want to use a tab, maybe you want to use a drop down, maybe you want to use a button. So this is what you can configure. And then finally, there's something called the entity selection display. Um, so typically, you'll have no display, um, but if you have a kind of, you know, involved use case for your editors where they need to do all these different selections, maybe they're selecting a bunch of different entities and they want to reorder them and kind of review what they've selected before saying okay, then you would configure this to be like 
displaying the selected entities as a grid or a table or whatever. So that was a lot. That diagram was rather intense. Um, so let's kind of like walk through what we're seeing here in the configuration screens. So first off, where is it? It's under configuration content authoring entity browsers. And you can have uh, multiple entity browsers on the system. So we're gonna take a look at this media browser one. Again, I'm just using Lightning Media's browser setup for this example. Um, so, first part was that display plugin, right? The iframe, the modal. So that's what you're selecting here in the first kind of uh, um, drop down. And then next is how you want your different browser widgets. Like, are the, are ed editors like using, are they using like the the view kind of display to like figure out which entities they want to select? So this is the tab, the buttons, the drop down. And then finally, you know, it, for this example, I'm not going to have the selection display. I'm going to keep it simple. So um, for the display uh, widget. You have some additional config that you can add. And then, because we didn't have any kind of involved kind of selection uh, display configured, we don't have anything to do here or here. And then here's finally the browser widgets. So uh, you have this view, the file upload widget. Uh, Lightning rolled their own for the, this embed code. A widget. So basically the idea behind it is you could, the editor can paste like um, an Instagram post embed code or a Twitter, a tweet embed code, and then behind the scenes there's some logic to determine which bundle to assign it to. So now that we've gone through the entity browser, um, you might want to use it with uh, a button on your WYSIWYG, right? Um, so for that, you would use something called Entity Embed. And again, this is Entities, so it can apply to media, it can apply to other things. So it's under Configuration Content Authoring Text Editor Embed Buttons. And first step is when you're defining your embed button, you have this entity type, um, which will display this dropdown so you can select which entity type you want to use, right? In this example, I'm just going to keep it simple and select file. So this is, this is a setup where I don't have the file entity uh, module installed. Um, I, I do have the media entity uh, module installed, but this file is just the core kind of file setup. So you can see um, the embed display plugins that are available are the ones coming from core, so image or uh, table of files or generic file, et cetera. Um, if I had selected like media entity or if I had a file entity module installed and I had view modes, those view modes would show up there. Um, and then here is where you connect your browser. So you have this option to connect to the entity browser for this. Um, you can also make a, a nice little button icon, otherwise it will show up as an E. Um, this icon E right there. And then here's an example just showing you like what this looks like. This is just Lightning. Um, so this is just the, um, that view where I was selecting an image of my cats. Um, and then just for kits, I wanted to show you this embed code business. So I'm just grabbing a tweet, dropping it in, placing it. And they have this nice option, similar to the media uh, library from 7 to save it to your media library. But you could totally configure that yourself, too, and, and add those fields. So um, I think, like, I wanted to just, like, just quickly go over some of these things. I have some quick review of other components in the uh, media initiative. This is, like, there's a lot going on. So there's no way I would cover everything in this talk. Um, but some other things to keep in mind are the crop API um, that also pairs up with this image widget crop. Um, the drop zone JS, uh, if you remember from the previous slide, um, 
where I was showing you the file browser. Um, they had in incorporated that drop zone JS library. Um, and then you can also check out the URL embed one. Um, I think we're, we're using this on a, a client project. Um, uh, there's other display modules out there um, available in Contrib. So these are different form field formatters and fallback ones. Um, so uh, an example, and I lost my notes, but that's okay. Um, would be like, uh, you know, first you would try, um, you know, if there's a, a YouTube, if you're, if you're loading up a YouTube video, first you try the HTML5 video player, um, and if that doesn't work, just fall back on a generic file link. Um, there are a lot of resources out there, so I'm going to just walk through some of them. Um, so we have the... The D8 Media Guide, there's a Git book out there. It's incomplete, but it is a great resource for information. Um, you can also check out the roadmap. Um, they are planning a lot of big things, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, there's, so last week, uh, as Alex mentioned earlier, there was DrupalCon Dublin. And so they had a core conversation about some of the media work that's happening, uh, that's being proposed for, for Drupal Core. Um, and Yanez um, also has tons of presentations from previous uh, DrupalCon or Drupal Camps um, that you know I highly recommend. Those are also uh, pretty, pretty interesting. But the core one, the most recent one from last week is, is, is really interesting. And I'm gonna highlight a couple things that came out of that. So first off, um, we have uh, in the first issue, and now these were just created last week, so this is like just beginning. So first is to is the proposal to basically fold in the media entity or some form of it um, into core, um, so that we have a standardized approach for handling both local, which local assets, which core already does but also remote assets. So to recap, like from earlier, when I was talking about the media module, you know, a remote asset might be like a, a reference to a YouTube video. Um, next is this prototype to create a design for the media library. So, you know, if we were, uh, so when I was talking about what's, what's new in core, um, we had that, pretty sad <laughs> file tab <laughs> that listed all the files on your system. Um, so the idea is to kind of like vamp that up so that it's more useful. They basically were just like trying to get something in um, for core um, and that's what, that's what they landed on. But the idea is to continue that work. Um, if you are a UX expert or designer, this is a great issue to get involved in. They are basically checking out what else is happening in the, um, in the competitor space for CMSs, so looking at WordPress, looking at what Sitecore is doing, et cetera, and trying to see like, okay, how can we kind of make this editor experience better in Drupal? How can we have a more standard kind of baseline way of showing what assets there are on the system and browsing them and showing like the appropriate metadata without having like contrib implementing all these different options that are all over the place. Let's bring that into core. Um, and then finally, uh, if this first proposal gets uh, um, addressed and there is um, uh, the media entity or some form of it available in core, that basically means that um, media storage is, is changing in core. So remember how I was showing you um, what core is offering in the toolbar, that image icon where you can embed an image file in the WYSIWYG? So that's making an assumption that your asset is an image. And if we're changing what 
you know, how we're storing media and like not assuming that it's going to be an image, then that means we have to change how we're supporting the embedding of entities in the WYSIWYG. Um, so these are three kind of like uh, very interesting issues uh, that, you know, at least follow them if you're interested. Just go to the node, click follow if you're interested in like what's going on with media and core. Also, um, if you're even more motivated, um, you can contribute. So there is an IRC channel called Drupal-Media. I joined that channel today to ask a question, and now I'm working on stuff. Um, but everybody's really friendly. It's really awesome. There are two different, here's some short links uh, for the issue queue. So um, if you're a novice, um, and it's really annoying that this eye is being cut off, but there's D8 media novices, uh, novice issues. And then here's the generic one um, for D8 media issues. So um, actually, this presentation went a lot shorter than I expected, but that's cool. Um, time for some Q&A. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if this is specifically Drupal related, but in the context of the first half where you're mostly media management, I wondered if there's a way to check for or optimize images based on if they're being displayed on a retina display or not. There have been mistakes where people post images, but they, they're they not, they're blurry or they're not optimized for retina display, and I wondered if that's something the media management could account for, possibly, or raise a set a flag? Um, so you can set, you know, like, oh, okay, you need, like, to be uploading images of a certain size or, or, or width. Um, so you can kind of start from there. Um, for your responsive image uh, style setup, let me try to go back to... this okay so here so say you know you have um, you want to have different image styles being served for the 1x and 2x right so this example is just showing like this breakpoint group is just saying like okay we're this is we're just dealing with 1x but you could in your YAML file define like all right this is what's going on for 1x and this is what's going on for 2x and then you would have two different field sets available where you could configure for that. But in terms of like the first initial file upload, you could set some requirements on your, your, um, your field. Anyone else? Oh. Paragraphs. Paragraphs module and use with media. Paragraphs and media? Like what specifically though? Adding, Adding media elements to paragraph items. Fields. So yeah, you just, they're just fields that you could just add. So there's nothing like specific to like, you know, the different components out there. It's just fields. Are you talking about like the browser kind of stuff, which you can do? Yeah, so you can do that. Um, so a couple things that uh, <laughs> I want to mention here. Um, so um, with so they're still working on the the user experience for the entity browser. Um, so one uh, issue that um, is kind of a an editorial complaint is that like if you're not using the entity browser and you're just using the image crop widget, like, you know, you have your node edit form and then the image crop widget is right there. And it's wonderful, it's beautiful. You, you upload your file, boom, 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 make your crops. Uh, when, you make, when you're using the entity browser, you're kind of referencing the entity and you have the option to add and have um, the edit button exposed and that's a little sucky because it's a two-step process. So the editor would click edit and then a modal window would pop up 
and then they can make their crops there. Um, so it's not, it's not a great experience right now. They're looking to like kind of fix that a bit. Um, another kind of side issue, since we're talking about crops, is one thing that I've seen, um, if you decide to use fly system, uh, there are a lot of patches that you'll need to use. Uh, one of those patches is having a temporary file uh, saved um, locally, and then because like you're sending it to a remote location, right? So that's going to be kind of slow. Um, so you, first you have a temporary local file saved. Um, to the system, and then you know eventually, you know it's going to send it out to your like S3 bucket. But when you have crops involved, it gets a little intense. Um, one uh, issue that I was looking at today is that I was noticing that the crop, um, the sorry, the image crop widget uh, module was saving the crops too many times, the crop entity too many times, which was resulting in an image flush, like for each save of that crop. Um, and if you can imagine, if you have a lot of image styles and you've also rolled in responsive images, so therefore you have lots of image styles, you're flushing tons of images, both either locally or on your S3. Um, when you're saving your crops. So there's, there's a bit of complexity with, with fly system um, out there if you decide to use it. But, you know, there's, there's some great support uh, in the issue queue and, and people are rather... Yes, Alex. I was going to wait till you were done. Oh, you raised your hand, so I responded immediately. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, has there been uh, discussions, talk, whatever, about um, using... Uh, external services to handle the image uh, manipulation. So like using Lambda functions or using Cloudinary or using some other such service for uh, cropping, for doing the actual image manipulation. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I don't really know. And if anyone would know, you would know. Since you are, have been working with the Crop I API, like. Very deeply. I, I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, I've worked with it a lot, but I've I don't know of any discussions. Yeah. We're, we've, we've been discussing it internally. Yeah. And but I wasn't, for example, in any of the stuff in Dublin. I don't know if it was discussed or anything like that. No, I haven't. I haven't seen anything for that. I think like right now. So basically, for the crop, that was of all the issues that they're looking to address right now. One that they said we're not going to be focusing on right now is crop, because they had so much on their plate already for just for just these three. And so. they have focal point that they could just use. Yeah. Hello. How come, Alex? Like, <laughs> I noticed that in the Git book, focal point is not listed. Is it not part of the D8 Media Initiative, or do you need to add that to the Git book? It's not technically part of the D8 Media Initiative. But, okay. I mean, one one could simply add add the line in there, and then it becomes part of the initiative, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I I I think um, so. I'm gonna embarrass Alex a little bit. So I I asked um, Alex to present on in the future uh, about uh, his his work with Focal Point and Crop API. So I'm really looking forward to that, and I definitely think you should hop in that IRC channel and be like, yeah. Let's add this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? Cool. Well, I mean, sorry, I guess like I expected to go a little bit longer, but I didn't. It's all right. I have a couple things to announce. <laughs> Yay! Oh, I do have one thing that I want to say. Oh, this has please. nothing to do with my presentation. Um, so, uh, if you guys noticed in the back, we have some flyers about the Drupal Association. So, if you are a member and you want to show it off, I got these great stickers, but they're only available for members. Ooh. So, if you want, sign up you right can just now. Just sign up. It's like really, right now. you know, 
I think it's like twenty five or thirty bucks. It could be anything. It'd be yeah. five dollars. But be the recommended, I think, is twenty five. Yeah, the recommended one. So if you're not um, sure about what uh, the DA, the Drupal Association, does, there's a flyer in the back. If you want a sticker, you can come talk to me. Then you can show off like how awesome you are in supporting. Make your friends jealous. All right, thank you, Mai. Woo! And thanks again to Jake for, uh, for the presentation earlier on YAML forms. Woo! And now that everybody in this room is, has seen a couple presentations, you all have some idea in your head of a presentation you would like to give. Make sure that you come up and, and talk to the various uh, organizers or, or get in touch with Ben. Um, so a couple of real quick things before we uh, adjourn. Thing number one is I was just uh, looking and uh, Drupal uh, 8.2 was just released not 18 hours ago. So I feel like this is a good venue to make that announcement. Um, one thing that the Drupal or some things that the Drupal community has been doing in terms of Drupal 8 releases as opposed that is new and is different is they're doing major um, or, or yeah, minor releases that have new functionality, new features and functionality. Um, so uh, Drupal 8.2, for example, has some very interesting layout tools uh, for trying to kind of design outside in. And if you want to know what I'm talking about when I say outside in, Dries has done a couple of different talks on this as like something um, that he's encouraging the Drupal community to start doing a lot more. Um, so definitely check out uh, 8.2. One other thing that was in there had to do with um, using external services to create your data in Drupal. I don't know, I didn't really read into it too much, but take a look, see what's new. Um, the other thing is that uh, something that was missing from the from the upcoming events, the, the uh, Long Island meetup is on the 18th of October. So anyone from Long Island? Who's from Long Island? A couple people, Long Island, Syosset, Plainview, no? Roslyn, all right, Roslyn. I grew up in Syosset, so. Um, so yeah, check out the Long Island meetup. Um, lastly, but not leastly, uh, our next meetup is Wednesday, November 2nd. That is, in fact, the first Wednesday of the month. Please do make sure that you sign up on meetup.com um, more than, let's call it, in October. At any point in October, you should check out the meetup.com um, page and, and say that you're coming. Uh, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your friends' neighbors, tell your neighbors' friends. Um, and, uh, and yeah, if you want to talk about presenting, uh, uh, email Ben and uh, see what we can do. And that's it. There's drinks. Oh, would you mind? Well, there's one more slide to remind everybody. The after party, Bill's Bar and Burger downstairs. The entrance is West 51st Street, um, sponsored by our good friends at Fastly. Um, thank you again to the NBCU Technology folks for sponsoring this great space and the food and the, and the beverages. And that's it. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here.